DevOps is a concept that is used a lot nowadays. If you, if you look at uh, annual reports today, and uh, let me go one slide back. There's a lot of annual reports. If you look at that, you see that most organizations are thinking about this digital enterprise. And even in the annual reports, they, they mention that they want to rationalize their service portfolio, eliminate legacy, move to cloud, adopt new technologies to create this digital enterprise and uh, enable new business models. And so now in the IT organization, you are basically challenged to deliver that promise. And, and this is the diagram that shows that a bit, is that the, the demands from the business is changing, the, the market is changing, the IT organization has to change, and also the way we manage IT needs to change. And a lot of organizations realize that, but there's still a lot of IT organizations that don't see the need to radically change their way of working. The organizations that do realize that, how they use DevOps as, as an example of an approach and continuous delivery. And during this presentation, I would like to show you how DevOps and continuous delivery uh, is basically can be enabled by IT for IT. Now, looking at the digital transformation, there, there are a number of key changes that uh, the IT landscape is going through that changes the way we need to manage IT. And one of them is, of course, cloud. And we talk about hybrid cloud. You have your clouds internally still, but also externally with many different SaaS paths and EaaS vendors. And as a result, you have a lot of vendors to manage. So it's a multi-vendor sourcing network that you get. And you source services to multiple parties. Typically, the traditional outsourcing was like in Shell, that they sourced an issue to three big vendors, and they have three big towers. And now they're thinking about changing the way we source items, smaller batches of works are sourcing to different vendors and cloud vendors as well. So you get more vendors to manage. Now at the same time, uh, you can see that yourself that we look, look at new ways of delivering services using microservices. We have uh, API economy, they talk, talk about it now, have many different interfaces with different components. Everything needs to be service defined. So you have an infrastructure as code and you define services as code basically in a source code repository and use new technologies like uh, even, even blockchain, for example. So there's a lot of new technologies coming, but I think the key ones are the, the cloud and the multi-vendor sourcing model that impact the way we manage IT. Now, a large amount of IT organizations, and I'm currently engaged in a number of financial institutions, and they see DevOps as their primary change of the way of working to enable this digital transformation, to enable the digital journey. So they look at DevOps, continuous delivery, and agile development. And at the same time, they see the need to, for example, explore infrastructure as code. Can we make an application pattern and refer to standard to infrastructure patterns and then deploy based on basically infrastructure and application as code? Uh, use containers or serverless computing microservices. So they try to combine a lot of things at the same time and, and at the same time implement agile practices and DevOps. Now, before we go into the details of how IT for IT can help DevOps, I would like to first talk about DevOps in a little bit more detail. So we, we know that the business is working on more agile way of working, so deliver faster, more secure, less risk, right? So it's the same as this diagram shows you. You would like to deliver in smaller chunks of work, release er earlier, because that's what is deliver value to the business. Uh, if, you, if you have the software available or a solution and you deliver it earlier to the business, they can generate value, assuming that this software generates value. So you want to deliver earlier. The advantage of that as well is you get earlier feedback of this functionality and improve it with the new uh, the early adopters community and so on. So basically by using this incremental approach, you deliver more value earlier and also reduce the risk because you don't have a big bang. Now that is a commonly known, of course, and people trying to implement this. Now, one of the key concepts, and, and Gene Kim, Kim is one of those uh, promoters of DevOps, and there's two of the books are shown here, the Phoenix Project, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that book, book, but it's really a nice story about the challenges an IT organization is going through. And DevOps is a key theme uh, in this book. And DevOps is not a methodology, it's not about tools, it's, it's about three key items that are shown here. So one is about really collaboration between the business and IT being development and operations together and creating cross-functional teams. So instead of having different silos, having teams that really have the, all the disciplines needed to deliver that value. 
but also it is key that ops is included in development so we think about the full life cycle of a service so we embed and instrument security for example during the development we also think about operations like automated provisioning and monitoring so Instead of just building functionality that the business needs, we at the same time build functionality that you need throughout the entire life cycle, like building resilience in an application. If it fills, fills, fills then you can restore it by uh, spinning up another component and it takes over that function. So that's one, it's, the, it's, it's a collaboration and, and, and the way we work together. The other one is also value streams and that's why IT5T fits very well with DevOps. So within DevOps, it's also about the value streams and creating value and it's about system thinking holistically. You're not focusing on individual components, but make something work for the business and demonstrate end-to-end -end workflows. And also visualize the work. When something comes in like a demand before it's released in production, can you visualize the end-to-end -end work stream uh, through uh, yeah, tools and methods to, to monitor that? And it's also about moving left. It's a similar as I just said about instrumentation. You want to prevent any defect, um, you know, resulting into production. So moving left between is, is meaning you do everything upfront to prevent any rework later on. And it even is about investing in the right things, right? If you, are, if, if you have an enhancement or a new user story, do we really need that? So it's about not doing the things that, uh, that don't add value, but also making sure that anything that can go wrong is resolved in the early stage. And then it's about all the continuous feedback loops, right? It's about continuously monitor, test, improve things, uh, and measure. There's a, in, in DevOps, there's a lot about scientific measurements. We want to measure things and monitor things, and it's similar in the, in the lean manufacturing uh, concept. Uh, measure the right things, and we can continuously improve. So it's a, and continuous improvement is, is a key item there. And of course you use uh, met methods like uh, for lean manufacturing about smaller batch sizes and, and create a pool of work. Now, so that, that is DevOps, but DevOps in reality um, doesn't tell you how to implement it. It doesn't tell you uh, what, what you need to run an IT DevOps organization. So that's why it's interesting to look at how can IT for IT complement that. But let's first look at what DevOps needs from a information and system perspective. So although I have to stress DevOps is not about tools, but I'm going to talk about tools at this moment, because one way or another, if you want to implement a DevOps pipeline, for example, you're going to try to automate as much as possible, getting insight and data out of that. So we have solutions that people need for planning the IT work, like having a backlog where all your user stories are stored. You have your analysis and design tools still needed. You got your code tools where you do the code uh, changing like an ID, a development coding, have a source code repository, do the code analysis. Then we have the build and continuous delivery tools, uh, an artifact repository where we store those builds. Then we need to deploy it before we can test it. And we have orchestration, infrastructure provisioning, application release automation. Uh, and of course, we have a bunch of different test components you need, like automated testing, but also security testing. Uh, we need performance and stress testing. So there's a lot of components that you need there. And then we release it into production. And the same, we have the, hopefully the same topologies we have deployed for tests. We can do the same to production and, and inform the users that something new has is, is, is arrived. And of course, then we're going to monitor uh, this environment and act upon the events. So, but there is actually more. So DevOps is typically focused on this, but it it takes it a little bit further. It also looks at the portfolio side of things. Uh, DevOps teams typically have a product owner and they continuously try to improve their product or service. While we also have a portfolio level and say, if we have 400 applications we need to support, or 400 services, what application do we need to prioritize on? And what can we, maybe we don't want to invest anymore because the value is not there. So it's managing the entire portfolio of services. But then you're not ready either, right? So this is really about automation and pipeline, but you still need to understand what service do I provide? So you have a sort of service administration there. You need to communicate and collaborate uh, with your business. You have to measure this, uh, measure analytics and reporting like big data for IT. You need to control it. You still, security is still a significant uh, component in the life cycle and managing the risks around this. And, and finally, also you still need to fund it. So yeah, there's a financial management involved. So before you know it, uh, implementing a DevOps world 
is very complex. If you leave it to the different teams that are going to implement DevOps, and they will, eh, you, they're starting to develop their own uh, build and continuous integration tools, they select their own test tools. So before you know it, you have a very complex IT management landscape. Well, a lot of capabilities are similar that the different DevOps teams need. So one of the challenges is that can we provide as it for it that blueprint to give guidance to all these DevOps teams? And this is an example of a landscape uh, in Shell to manage this, uh, also the DevOps world. We have the continuous delivery tools, the testing tools, the automated deployment tools, the monitoring systems, the risk management and compliance, security monitoring, identity and access management, and so on. And larger IT organizations, they all need this type of capability. And there's not much you can eliminate. Maybe you can standardize and simplify it and combine components, but it, it is a very complex um, domain. A and most organizations, if you ask them, uh, how does a demand come in in your IT organization and how does it flow through the entire pipeline before something is actually delivering value? And can you then monitor that value? It's not uncommon that there may be more than 50 tools are needed from an initial demand registration until something is proven to provide a value. And typically, there are different administrations that you use, right? So you have tools like capturing your portfolio, service portfolio management, have a project management system, your requirements management tool, or an agile tool where you manage your Kanban boards, you've got your source code repository, you've got your code analysis tools, continuous integration, security, and so on. And the challenge is that these tools are typically not very well integrated, so you don't have the end-to-end -end visibility we'd like to achieve. Because if we want to do DevOps, you really want to understand where is something in the progress of the whole chain. When a demand comes into production, or if there's a defect detected, can you solve it immediately? Uh, so that visibility is, there, is not there today, and we need to solve that for, for the DevOps world, right? Um, and as a result, and that's not uh, uncommon, even organizations that are very advanced in DevOps, they will still face this problem here. They still have a lot of different solutions they need to manage this end-to-end -end automated pipeline. So they still have different repositories. So the product owner needs to log into a system to understand what are my user stories. They need to log into another system to see what's happening in production. Uh, the same for the risk analyst. They have their own tool for managing the risk against those services. And we have cloud automation engineers making the patterns for automated provisioning of an infrastructure pattern and other people building the application blueprints for the automation and deploying the application in an automated fashion. Um, and other people look at the consumption of the cloud. Yeah, they look at how much resources are consuming from Amazon or Azure and can I calculate it back and do I, do I need to turn things off if they don't add value, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of components, there's a lot of data and typically that data is incompatible. There's no single source where you can find or search the data. I'm not saying that everything needs to be in one repository, but what you'd like to achieve is the ability to combine data and search across all these repositories. So a lot of um, effort is today lost in production by people looking at data, they have to go through different logs, uh, ask people where is, what has changed recently. Even in the DevOps world, they still have a lot of repositories to go through. As a result, there's not really transparency and the ability to continuously improve your IT function. And it's a similar concept like this, is that you have a lot of repositories and within it for it what we try to do is create a common language of what data do you manage across the different components that we can create a kind of a data lake for IT and get valuable information out of it uh, without knowing maybe where the data is stored as long as we can reach it. I don't, we don't need to uh, you know, copy all the data or federate it, but that, that's different methods you can use. Or you can even think about blockchain as a technology where, where data is really uh, replicated in a lot of places where you can find the data on different places and it's, it's trustful information. Now, in the past, uh, we, we got away with this way, way of working, right? We have different tools and, uh, and, and even if you have a pipeline automated, you got away with it. But in a new world, uh, it is very difficult to get away with it because the number of components is increasing. We don't have large applications, we have a lot of small applications. We have to deal with many more APIs and interfaces. We have to ma manage more vendors. We have more agile teams. So in the past, we had a, a number of siloed teams, and maybe we ha and, and we have maybe a team that's around specific applications, and have a network team and a database team. Now we end up maybe a few hundred agile teams. They're each uh, building their own capabilities. 
And of course, we have more requests because people want access to a service, and then when they move to another business, that we need to react, take their rights back again. Uh, so we have more and more releases, more changes, more incidents, more security events. So there is a need now, more than ever, to automate and automate more and more of this whole chain. Now, that's, of course, where the IT4IT reference architecture comes in. It provides you the, the, the capabilities to manage this IT and automate the it for it activities for the DevOps world, but also for continuous delivery, um, and provide you that insight because there's a common data model beneath it so that data from different systems can be combined. Um, just to show, highlight a bit where how DevOps can be positioned into the value streams of um, it for it I simplified the it for it model here a bit. So the development and DevOps is basically about the requirement to deploy, typically about continuously deliver new versions, new releases, and get that out there quick, quickly, and also deploying that as quickly as possible, and then once it is in production, we can monitor and support that. But you see there is, in the it for it world, there's much more than that. It's not about an individual application or service that you can continuously de develop and deploy and operate and monitor. It's also about the portfolio side. We typically have a few hundred of those services to manage. And suddenly we need to think about what has more as a more priority and how do we manage the entire portfolio? How do we move applications to the cloud, for example? Manage the financials, manage the risks, and manage our licenses and our contract with the vendors. Uh, so it it adds on top of DevOps, basically, the capabilities to really manage that whole portfolio of all those agile teams and all those different pipelines. To enable, as, as we stated in before, and, and this is also it it but also DevOps, get the continuous feedback loops and also focus on the value and optimize the workflow from a demand to production or if something is detected in operations, resolve this as quickly as possible. So if you look at the number of those use cases uh, where, where also DevOps is implementing, you see each of the value streams, there are some key uh, example use cases. Uh, for example, for the strategy to a portfolio, it's really about there's a bigger demand coming in and we need to prioritize whether we want to invest in this. It could be a new service or ability to rationalize our existing services uh, or moving applications to the cloud and, and, manage, and manage that could also be uh, managing technology refresh or end of life of key services, and we need to get rid of those. And in the requirement to deploy, we have those use cases that are focusing typically on a specific service and then continuously deliver that service. So it's basically the continuous delivery part of it, having the requirements backlog maintained and building the epics and then continuously deliver releases based on the new requirements that are coming up. Um, we could also fixing issues like a defect uh, or a problem that has been identified in production and fix it in, a, in, a, in, a, in an emergency release. So it's about that continuous delivery. And the request to fulfill typically uh, is also about provisioning the application to a test and production environment. But, and that's typically where you see DevOps, they stop. They think about, okay, it's running now, but, but in IT for IT and IT management, that's much more. Once the application is there, people need to subscribe to it. So you need to have the ability for end users to request access to that service. We provision the access, we monitor whether they still need it, and do costing and chargeback, for example. Um, so people can cancel subscriptions to those kind of services. There's a lot of automation involved in that part uh, as well, like the example that was given by Dan about onboarding a new person into your organization. What do you need to do to onboard that person uh, and what kind of request and automation you need for that to happen? And then the detect to correct basically resolve all the operational issues and, and ensure continuous operations. So it could be as simple as an end user has a request or an issue through self-help is resolved. Could be a security related incident that needs to resolve uh, or a vulnerability, for example or performance related issues. If there's a performance issue, can we out of scale uh, the environment so that we add additional capacity? Uh, or when we see that an application is not used that much, we can maybe uh, reduce the capacity allocated to it to save costs. Uh, and of course, more, be more proactive, prevent outages or prevent issues there. Uh, but there is more, of course, in related to the costs. Uh, we have use cases for managing the risk, cost and compliance. Now. If you want to implement those kind of use cases, you, you typically need a lot of, as, as I showed before, there's a lot of building blocks you need to implement. From an architecture perspective, you could say, what are the building blocks I need? And it typically doesn't really make sense to select all those components and then try to integrate them. Because uh, there, there is a, all the components have in the market, they don't have an open interface. So 
it doesn't make sense to say, okay, I need uh, my same DB money to be improved, so I'm gonna buy a discovery tool and hope that resolves my issue. Uh, it's a little bit more challenging than that, but you can imagine we need to think about those building blocks. Where do we invest in and how do we integrate those? Now, how do, so further on in the presentation, we'd like to demonstrate how, do you, how can you take an approach on that and uh, what, is, what are the logical steps? Because the vendor market is very complex in IT for IT. And here you see an example of the different vendors, and it's not even complete, right? There's a lot of vendors building capabilities for this DevOps world, for the continuous delivery world, for the IT for IT landscape. Uh, vendors on the strategy portfolio side for managing your portfolios, the enterprise architecture, whole continuous delivery components that you need, uh, release and deployment automation monitoring, and a lot of supporting components for the finance and risk and compliance and so on. So it's a very complex landscape, and that's why there is a need more and more that we help the customer or the organization consuming IT to create a pipeline and select the components that really integrate and, and create interoperability. Now, this slide I used before in another presentation, but that's actually showing what IT for IT is all about, is trying to connect the different components to make an end-to-end -end chain, to make end-to-end -end workflow visible, and hopefully that each vendor that now has different connectors will use IT for IT, uh, as HP is showing their example, making it open and integrate with different components to create an end-to-end -end value chain. And this is an example of the Thingiverse, I'm not sure if you know that, from, uh, uh, it's, it's something for 3D printing. But you can see IT for IT as that kit that we can create a sort of open interface that we can connect different components together. Uh, and, and an example of that, it would be that you have a new uh, demand coming in, it goes through a service portfo portfolio process, it is coming in the backlog, it's developed, it's tested, deployed, and meanwhile we can track and trace the progress, we know what version it is, where it is deployed, what does it cost, all those things, right? Which span a lot of different processes, tools, and, and data repositories. Now, so first, um, a lot of IT organizations need to realize that they need to transform then there's a significant change needed. The traditional way of working will not help in this new DevOps world or this new world where we need continuous delivery. So there's a first I need to realize that. And the good thing is that most IT organizations are working on this path to DevOps and organizing themselves around value streams and trying to standardize the way they, they work. Because one of the things that they realize if you want to automate your end-to-end -end pipelines, you need to standardize. And it's on the infrastructure layer that you need to standardize, but even on the way we develop services and maintain services uh, to get that transparency and integration. So th that is one of the challenges, of course, because we're not in greenfield uh, uh, environment in most cases. There's a lot of legacy out there. Now, let's look at the next slide, yeah. This is a high-level approach that was also documented in the uh, IT for IT management guide. I will not go in this uh, slide in much detail, but I would like to zoom in to some of those elements, how you can get started with IT for IT to enable this DevOps journey. And of course, there is a, uh, you start typically with a vision without knowing exactly where you end, because it's, it, and that shows here, it's iterative approach. It's not something that you can implement IT for IT or DevOps immediately. We also need a sort of agile approach implementing IT for IT. But it starts with a clear vision where your IT organization is heading, and, and that relates to culture, this relates to the strategy of the business. So you organize, you create that vision, and DevOps sits in that vision, and being a broker could sit in the vision and move services to the cloud and be able to be transparent and be easy to work with. And that kind of concepts that, that guide the way you think an IT organization should work. And then you need to think about, but actually how do I then need to organize myself to, to be that? And typically my current IT management tools potentially will not fit in that. So you need to rethink about how do I organize that and where do I go to? Now, there are a few approaches where you can take to implement this. And uh, the, most of them start at least is understanding the entire value chain and the value stream. So that's a common method used in the DevOps world as well and continuous delivery. Look at your value stream. So there's a demand coming in on the left and what are the activities that the system or the process goes through to, to actually get something in production. 
And that's a lot of effort because when, I, when I'm working now in a financial uh, organization, it's very difficult to, from one end to the other end, yeah, from the start to the end, get a good understanding of what is really needed. It could be even a risk uh, approval somewhere in between, or how do we get something released in production. So getting a common understanding how things are done today. And the challenge, of course, is that that could be different for each line of business and application. Uh, so we really need to look at how is that value generated. You need to look at how it's done today, because typically what you will hear is that most businesses will say, oh, but I already know that, and I'm already doing it, so you know, next year we, we are ready for DevOps. So they will always tell you, I'm ready on it, I'm, I'm working on it, I'm, I solve, I've almost solved it, right? And that's what they have been saying for 10 years. We almost solved it, next release or next week or next month. But you really need to go see what's actually happening there and identify, for example, key work cues. Where, where is the work distributed? And the work could be as simple as a user story that is managed in my agile development tool, or I have a risk assessment where my risk tool is work defined, or my incident, or my problems, or my request. Uh, it could be a test task that people perform, and look at how that is organized and integrated. Now, if you do that, you typically will see, well, there's a lot of spreadsheets in between to make things work. And of course, you've got a lot of system to doing that. And analyzing that, plotting that to the IT for IT architecture, you find that work is distributed in a lot of different queues. So we have maybe on the portfolio side, we have a portfolio backlog where the topics and epics are defined with where we want to invest in. Then we have a product backlog. We have backlogs for problems and incidents and, and maybe the request and deployment and risk and, and compliance and architecture. And what IT for IT does, is helping to organize all those backlogs to get understanding of all the work that in IT organization is planned and worked on and get that traceability because they're typically related to that common service that we talked about, this is the service backbone. Um, because what is also done typically is that you go through this value chain and you identify impediments, right? That, that's the agile and the lean uh, people like to identify impediments. Uh, and this is an example of typical impediments that the most IT organizations face uh, in, in moving to the DevOps strategy. So that they analyze their workflow, and this is where they come up with the uh, typical impediments. So one of them is, for example, we have not a clear funnel, of, um, a tool to manage all the funnel of, of demands coming in. Uh, we don't have a single service portfolio with understanding of all the services we have or we miss end-to-end -end traceability from a requirement to until something is in production, for example. Or there's a lot of rework, or testing just takes too long. So we want to test, but the test environment is not available, and it takes two weeks to get the test environment there. Uh, or uh, the actual approval of the change going in production is too bureaucratic, so we are ready, but it, you need to already two weeks up front tell you that you're going in production, so you need to wait. There's a lot of wait time. Uh, Although I see that the CNB is not up to date, and they say, well, as long as the CNB is not up to date, I, 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 don't, I, I cannot do monitoring correctly and have the impact. Or there is no good self-service, we don't have insight in custom experience. Um, and uh, yeah, the supplier contracts, they are blocking us. So we have supplier contracts, but if I want to order a server at my outsourcer, yeah, the, co the, the contract of the procedure says that we have this and this steps to do, so it takes four weeks to get that server up and running. Now, those are typical issues, impediments, bottlenecks to implement DevOps or implement IT for IT. And that's one of the challenges because what happens typically in a lean approach, they just want to fix these. And well, for example, how do they fix things? They say, oh, we have to see the business up to date. Let's fix it. We select a good discovery tool and that will populate my CNV. It will not fix the problem because the problem is not that the CNV is not up to date. It's more about how, how does it really integrate with if you have a new release, somebody orders infrastructure, how do we know which is, belongs to what? Discovery will not solve that. It adds new data, but it doesn't tell you who ordered this and why and where does it belong to, for example. So we typically don't fix the real problem by fixing individual in impediments. We only fix the real problem if we're gonna look at it from an end-to-end -end perspective and then say, okay, what is the first step that we need to do? Probably seem to be a change. This is not the first thing we need to do. Get an understanding of what the end to end pipeline looks like and how do we want to improve that. So we need to think first from a system perspective. So, and, and that's basically DevOps as well, or looking at from an end to end perspective and then focus, okay, what do we need to, to do to improve this? And uh, one of the key things we would like to achieve, at least 
in, in the DevOps and continuous delivery uh, space, we want to automate as much as possible uh, across the entire pipeline so that we can have a repetitive and, and it's traceable. Um, and it doesn't mean that every task needs to be automated as long as we can trace it back in, into the entire chain. Um, and uh, this is what I explained a bit earlier as well. So the challenge is that there are already so many initiatives that your IT organization is taking. Uh, if you ask an organization and they move to DevOps, they have all these projects uh, currently up and running. So they have the continuous delivery project, they have a scrum and agile delivery project, they have maybe the scene to be, oh yeah, application performance monitoring, they want that as well, of course, because then you have an understanding how well my application is performing in production. So they want all these capabilities, yeah, and security wants uh, cyber defense monitoring. So before you know it, you have all these separate initiative and projects running. And, and that is typically already running in your IT organization today without any glue in between. So, and there's some, oh yeah, identity access management, of course, knowledge base. So you can imagine a lot of things are under the uh, implementation today to improve your IT function. Now, so the question is then, how do you really start? Because if you want to implement all those capabilities at the same time, that doesn't really help that much. It will not result into end-to-end -end value creation in a lot of ways. So one of the things you could do is uh, implement a value stream. So that's one approach. And typically, a lot of organizations, they, they start with, for example, requirement to deploy. That's the first value stream they start with because they have a continuous delivery um, project continuous integration, continuous delivery, and they select one of more applications and work on the backlog there, getting the coding, development, testing, and deployment. That is, could be a method, and once you have that, you can onboard other applications. Uh, another customer that I've been working for is more focused on the request to fulfill. They say, we want to automate all those recurring uh, requests, like people wanting access to an application, or order new infrastructure services, or modify the capacity allocated to it, or cancel subscriptions. Uh, so that's one approach, or of course, uh, detect to correct and focus on uh, monitoring and get the automated cor um, incident creation and, maybe, and also maybe resolving automatically. So the whole pipeline of detecting to, to resolve. Um, the challenge is that it is typically a lot of effort because uh, you or want to take this monitoring for a lot of applications at the same time. So an alternative approach could be that you do a more uh, select a early mover application or service as a team and try to really implement it across the entire value chain. So we implement partially for that team the, the backlog on the portfolio side, manage the high level epics there. We, we implement, for example, the, for the, the request to deploy and so on. So you have the entire chain end to end uh, fulfilled for one team. And that doesn't solve all the issues because you cannot uh, automate everything at the same time, but it gets you a learning curve and a demonstration of how the new IT organization need to work. And you also need to understand that you have different pipelines. So uh, for example, for I, I call it an application, but the term application slash service should be used better. We have services that are developed like an application services, but we also have infrastructure services being developed. If you develop a new cloud, service that is also going through the same pipeline, but then there's more infrastructure related components and services. But the challenge is that you end up with different pipelines depending on the type of technology, but hopefully a lot of common components are used. So for example, what you could do is start with a .NET application or Java and take that application from an end-to-end -end perspective and implement that pipeline with standardized components as much as possible. So on the left side, we make sure that the, the, for that specific YAV applications, the epics are stored, the, the service is identified, the owner is identified, we develop, the, we maintain the source code, do the continuous delivery, make sure that people can access, uh, re raise requests for accessing that service, and we make sure that monitoring is enabled. So that's what organizations are trying to do, create a small application end-to-end, -end, and that way you can learn how um, things need to be managed. For example, things like, okay, when do we use a, a risk sign-off in, in a stage? Or if we run into issues of getting infrastructure faster provisioned, uh, maybe we can fix that temporarily, but at least get the flow end-to-end -end working. This demonstrates then the new way of working in a DevOps environment, and based on that, there is learning. So typically, creating an end-to-end -end flow, uh, hopefully you can do that in three, 
to six months for a number of applications, as long as they are simple stack application like .NET on the Azure cloud or a Java application on Amazon, have a sort of standard patterns there where you can deploy with automated provisioning, that you do monitoring for those components, but a very lightweight limited for a number of applications. And then based on that, you learn how to apply IT for IT, you learn how, wh where are opportunities to automate and identify issues for improvement and not focusing only on the tools, but also on the way of working um, with the different teams. And th this is about the way of working because DevOps is, is, is not that simple that you say, we just have a DevOps team that does everything. In reality, you have, for example, service DevOps teams that develop services, uh, like a, a specific CRM application, for example, they have a, a DevOps teams and they develop that service or maintain that. But we also have a sort of brokering DevOps teams that maintains the standard infrastructure components. And we don't want every team to manage to define that. We just have one team developing standard patterns, infrastructure patterns, and every uh, ap application team can reuse those patterns while they can focus on building their topology or blueprints for the application, reusing standard blueprints, for example, for serverless computing or standard uh, load balancing web servers and the database, uh, having those predefined with security metrics in it because that's where you have the teams below main defining those standard deployment patterns from an infrastructure perspective. So, um, and, and so that it is a challenge to organize around standard patterns on the bottom and then have the different teams working on that and reuse what is defined uh, below. Uh, and this way you make sure that the development teams can focus their value delivering business value for the applications and they don't need to understand how infrastructure needs provisions. We give them uh, infrastructure as code templates, they can use that. Of course, they need to understand a little bit about the infrastructure layer, but typically we don't want them to reinvent the wheel how security needs to be organized in Azure or how to provision a whole stack with load balances down to the, uh, to this, to the database, for example. Um, and then there is also a governance involved in your organization. <coughs> if you want to implement DevOps or implement IT for IT, uh, then you could, you could say, okay, who will be owning these, all these automation capabilities in the IT organization? Uh, so typically you can think about like a safe, uh, skilled agile framework on the portfolio. There is somebody responsible for the IT for IT portfolio for all your automation tools that you have in your enterprise. Uh, there are different value stream owners that focus on improving the, the, the tooling and the processes and the way of working uh, within the value streams, like somebody responsible requirement to deploy, developing the practices around continuous delivery there. And of course, the different teams working on the solutions like uh, the deployment tools and the monitoring tools. So to wrap up, um, is. The story was about business is changing and IT is changing, and also the role of IT has changed. And most IT organizations now realize they need to transform in a sort of cloud brokering, multi-vendor sourcing models, and they will apply new methods, like DevOps will probably be a key method or principle that they will use. And to implement DevOps, for example, or continuous delivery, they will be more uh, dependent on having to automate the IT capabilities and use IT for IT as that uh, yeah, foundation basically for implementing DevOps. Uh, so coming back to the Phoenix project, that was that book of uh, Gene Kim. And you know, there's a lot of challenges and issues identified there. And it, was, it, it would have been nice if the Phoenix project had that IT for IT reference architecture because that would have solved a lot of their problems that they were facing. So now getting your IT organization ready for the digital enterprise 3.0. That is probably what you face in your IT organization as well. And uh, yeah, I see that something uh, is broken because you really need IT for IT reference architecture to get your IT organization ready for the digital enterprise. And I'm not sure if you've seen this kind of slide before when something is wrong with, uh, with your machine. They have a number of options that you can go through. One, of course, you could say, I'm gonna troubleshoot and start to fix it myself like a lot of organizations are doing today. They're going through the journey of DevOps and try to fix it themselves. Or even there's an option to turn off your IT organization completely. Or there's one on the other option is uh, basically continue and using IT for IT to get started with this new digital realization and digital enterprise. Thank you.